desert. It's too damn hot there for me. And it's too damn hot in here for me. I wore a coat, long sleeve shirt, so I could be presentable. You might not like my speech, but you might like to look at me without my coat. And uh, my name is George Ciampa. I'm Italian. We have two volumes in our voices. Loud and louder. So you might know I come here and the damn mic isn't working, right? Can you hear what I said? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Y'all have hearing aids? Yeah. I don't. And they're at home in a drawer. And I got them from the VA. I got one pair and uh, I couldn't find them. So I went back and got another pair. And they said, hey, these are like $6,500. We'll give you another pair, but that's it. So I took that pair home and I found the other pair. So now I got two pair. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I was with the 607th Graves Registration Company, 124 enlisted men and officers. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, the officers didn't do a damn thing. The rest of us did all the work. And, uh, you know, I tried to get in the Air Corps when I was 18. I graduated from high school the same day I was 17. I worked with Douglas Aircraft on SBD dive bombers, Navy dive bombers. And I thought, geez, it wouldn't be great to, to fly with these because I used to sit. We'd, we'd, we'd take them out on the tarmac and I'd do all the finishing touches in the cockpit, including the piss tubes. You know what that is, you guys in the Air Force? Anyway, uh, my brother was in the Air Corps and my brother-in-law, and I thought, I look at them with their tipped hats and they walk with a swagger and all the girls are looking at them. I thought, that's what I want to do. So I tried to sign up. My eyes were 2022, and so I flicked it. The doctor said, eat a lot of carrots and come back and try it again. I did. Didn't work. So uh, I flicked it again, so then I got drafted. And uh, I had to go to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and right next to us was an air base. You guys know about that air base, Fort Warren? Anyway, uh, the Air Force, the Army Air Force was hurting for pilots. And this was in March of 44, three months before the invasion. And so uh, I thought, uh, I heard that they had lowered the eye requirements. <coughs> and uh, actually they did, uh, they lowered the eye requirements to 2030. No glasses. Nobody knows that except me. <coughs> Excuse me. But they did lower the eye requirements. And so I, they accepted me. And then they notified my company commander. And you know what? Hit the fan. And so he transferred me out of the company I was in, which was a 610th grade registration, a bunch of young guys. And I was a replacement for another grade registration, the 607th. The guys were all older than I was. I was the youngest guy in that outfit, and I think they're all dead now. Uh, I was 18. On the way overseas, the guys are all kidding me. Don't worry, Chapa, they're going to turn the ship around and take you home. Roosevelt said, no 18-year-old will set foot on foreign soil. Anybody know that? Well, that's the truth. And so I had a cousin in the Navy killed when he was 17. You know, in the Navy, they take you when you're 17. I think the Marines does. Uh, by the way, in the Army, they told me I had 20-20 vision. Uh, <laughs> anyway, can you hear me? So, uh, on the ship, uh, we landed at Liverpool, England, and they broke our company up into four platoons and a headquarters platoon. And so, I was in a fourth platoon. And, uh, uh, like I said, I was the youngest of the bunch. So they broke us up to send us to different cities in England. And we went to, my platoon went to Bristol, and where we could see all the uh, bomb craters around in Bristol from the bombing they were getting from the Germans. Anyway, we were there for a while, and then they, they sent us to uh, St. Austell, which is in Land's End, near the ports, Falmouth and Portsmouth. And before they sent us there, however, they gave us some bad news. Anybody here know about Exercise Tiger? Anybody know? You know. One person. No. Two? That's the one where they had the Yeah, I, I'd advise you to get the book out of the library. 
And you'll see in the index at the back is a 607 grain registration company. We, we had uh, the Army, Navy, whatever, the exp expeditionary forces had an exercise called Exercise Hire. It was right, right off the coast of England. Slapped in the sand, this is called. There were four LSTs out there on a practice landing on the shores there slapped in the sand. <coughs> of the four LSTs, three of them were sunk, torpedoed by a German torpedo boat. And uh, we lost 18 guys, six survivors. The six survivors, ironically, were all privates. But we lost the lieutenant, the first sergeant, we lost all, all the officers. And so when we got that news, you know, it scared the hell out of us. We said, you know, no dry run, this is a war. So uh, we were built in, in private houses in, in England just for sleeping accommodations, not for food, but the British people there where we stayed gave us the black market eggs, mom and pop knee bone, who I kept in touch with after the war until they died. But uh, that's another story. Anyway, uh, we, uh, we uh, left from uh, Falmouth. And, uh, and uh, we, this was in the daytime. And while I was on the ship, I met a, a Navy a sailor who was a gunner. Uh, he was my age, a little bit older. But anyway, uh, uh, I got acquainted with him, and he showed me their quarters. You know, when I looked at that quarters, I thought I should have been in the Navy. <coughs> anyway, <coughs> during the night, uh, we were down in the hold of the ship sleeping, and all of a sudden, a huge explosion. And we all scampered up on deck to see what the heck was going on. I said, middle of the night. <coughs> anyway, we found out what happened. This Navy gunner that I had met, he shot this torpedo plane down with a torpedo aimed at our ship. That's what the big explosion was. And uh, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here now. Uh, Richard Blake from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, anyway, uh, next thing happened is we hit a mine cable. It was no big deal. By the way, I had a Mae West on and a, and a life belt, both, because I couldn't swim. I wouldn't take any chances. <laughs> Not that swimming would do you a damn bit of good. You know. You just drown sore. That's all. So anyway, uh, first thing you know, we're, we're approaching all these ships. Uh, nobody knows really how many were out there. The LA Times said 4,000. I used to work for the LA Times, and I did a plaque that shows the first page of the LA Times on uh, June 6, 1944. And it says 4,000 ships. Then later on, here's 5,000 ships. Anyway, there were a lot of ships out there. And so we're one of them. We're, uh, we're actually anchored uh, broadside. There's the shore. We're broadside over here. And the Germans are shooting at all these ships with the 88s. We call them screaming memes because you hear them scream going over you. And so all of us scampered on the opposite side of a ship of the shore against the bulkhead. Everybody knows what a bulkhead is, right? So we're standing against the bulkhead to get some protection because they're they're hitting ships and so looking at a tanker blowing up and debris in the water, bodies in the water, and we're waiting for our turn to get off the ship. I have no idea how long it was. It seemed like hours, I'm sure it was. But uh, I'd go down a rope ladder. Skinny me, I weighed between 112 and 115 pounds. The guys used to say, hey, Champa, turn sideways and we can't see you. You know, like that. Yeah, you know what I mean? So anyway, uh, I go down that rope ladder and get in a L L L LCI, that's the smaller landing craft called Higgins Boats, and I got in that thing and there was a jeep in there and I sat in a jeep and uh, we started to go in, we could hear the 88s screaming over us and we thought they were zeroed in on us and they turned around and went back out and then turned around and went back out. The third time we go in and I find out much, much later the reason for doing that is they're looking for a place to land where there's no obstacles in the water. Okay, so anyway, we finally get there and we can't go all the way in. And 
And uh, like I said, I couldn't swim, not to do any good. Had all this gear on, you know. And so I'm wading in the water up to about here, I guess. I, you know what? I can't remember a lot of that landing. I blanked out. I've done a story called uh, my, my uh, masterpiece uh, called Silent Dog Tags. You know why they're silent. The guys are dead, right? Because that's our job, to pick up the dead. So I did, and when I was 24 years old, I wrote that typewriter. Now it's on my computer, and now it's getting revised again to put in a book format, Matt, where I'll have a book. Uh, it'll be about a uh, 50 page book uh, and uh, that tells all about my service, what, what I experienced. Uh, and so anyway, uh, my wife, when she read that, she said, oh gee, don't even think about it. You might, might ba bring back bad memories. Well, you know, I never got the PTS, PTSD, is that what they call it? And people wonder why I didn't get it because we handle bodies every day in France, in Belgium, except one day, 11 months, picking up the dead, Americans and Germans. We, we handled about 75,000 dead Americans and Germans. We buried the Germans in a separate cemetery, temporary. These are temporary cemeteries where you put the guys in mattress covers and put them in the dirt. And we had uh, service troops doing that in Normandy. A couple of days later, we had German prisoners doing that. And, and after that, we had German prisoners doing that uh, throughout France, Belgium, and Germany. But you know what? Uh, it was a very hard job for me. And I'll tell you why it was especially hard for me. Because when I was five years old in Boston, Massachusetts, an Italian family, uh, my mother and father came from Italy and met here, got married, had 10 kids. I'm, I'm the, uh, the ninth of 10, and my, the tenth, my sister, I just died last week, and she was a year and a half younger than I am, and uh, she was in Oklahoma. I haven't seen her for a few years, uh, but anyway, at, at a funeral of my little cousin Teresa, who was eight years old, I'm standing at the gra grave site with my mother. My mother, who had lost her voice before that event, it came back to her. And as they were loading the casket in the grave before us, so that's what they did, uh, my mother screamed, Teresa. And I can see that. I can look over there right now and see the grave and my mother here screaming, Teresa. And so that gave me a big fear of death for a long time. And so uh, then they put me in the grave registration. I got to handle bodies. <laughs> now, what do you think that was like? Yeah. I mean, I broke down about two weeks late after in Normandy. And the lieutenant pulled out his 45, stuck it in my ribs, and said, you get your ass back out there, suck it up. You know, in World War II, they didn't baby you. Who were World War II guys here? World War II guys anywhere near combat? You know, our job was not to shoot the Germans. We, we carried carbine rifles, which are pretty good for about 100 yards, not more than that. But our, our job was to Bury the dead. We worked with the, with the combat medics that you don't hear enough about. We were at collection points where they were watching guys die, and some of the guys saying, "Well, that guy's dying. You can take him." And uh, and so uh, uh, the Germans didn't pick up their dead. We did, and they put them in a temporary cemetery across the road from our cemeteries. Can you guys hear me? Okay. You might know they don't have a damn mic when I come here. <laughs> Scott, what the hell are you doing to me? Okay, anyway, I'm just kidding, just kidding. But you know, I escaped the desert to, to go to Torrance for the summer. I'm sweating here. Look at you guys. Nobody's hot except me. So anyway, okay, and my coat's over there. <laughs> my phone is getting charged over there. I had a hell of a time finding this place. They rerouted me over. I put down 2850, and they kept going to 850. And I kept telling them, no, 2850, four or five times. They keep sending me all over the damn place. So, you know, I'm worn out before I get here. Now, what you know, I don't have a prepared speech. I've talked to, I've been, I've been uh, uh, interviewed a lot, and uh, not bragging but especially doing my sixth film 
which was my last documentary. I've been doing documentaries since 2006. When I was 81, I turned filmmaker. And I just retired from that. But I still have work to do. But anyway, uh, the, the sixth film was in Normandy on June 6th, June, actually 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th of, 19, of 2019. The timing was just right to do this. I wouldn't have been able to do it in 2020 or even 2021. But uh, I did that film and I took other D-Day veterans. It turned out that I had 10 D-Day veterans in Normandy, all interviewed, including myself, as to their D-Day experience. American Airlines sent us first class. American Airlines has helped me through four by six films. Unbelievable what they've done for me. Anyway, by the way, I, I have, I brought a few of those. I only brought 10, so one. <laughs> uh, I sell them on my website. And uh, I'll give you my website, but you don't want to buy it there because it's $20 plus $5 shipping plus California sales tax. If you buy anything for me, it's $15, period. Okay, get, get over that. That's the commercial. Okay, now, <laughs> going back to the film. Uh, and where the hell was I? Now, like I say, I never prepare anything because I never know what the hell I'm going to say. And I talk, I've talked to thousands of kids in high schools, not only here, but in France and Belgium. And they really welcome you over there. Uh, they just love to have a, a GI come back and talk to them. Unbelievable. And, uh, but anyway, uh, let me finish where I was. Uh, the cemeteries, uh, those t seven tem 17 temporary cemeteries, not all of them, but what they did after the war, two years after the war, 1947, they built permanent cemeteries. Beautiful. Have any of you seen a cemetery over there? How many? Okay, beautiful, right? White marble, crosses, marble imported from Italy, crosses and stars of David. And guess what's on the, on the tombstones? Guess what information, I'll give you part of the information. The soldier's name, the unit he was in, the uh, state that he came from, what else? What, what else? Huh? Yeah. Frank and what outfit he was in. There's no date of birth. No date of birth. Only the date of death, which is approximated a lot, as I know. And I called the ABMC, that's the American Battle Monuments Commission, who built the cemeteries. The cemeteries are all beautiful. In my opinion, better than anything here. Now, after the war, next of kin had a prerogative of having to remain set home in a lined casket of course, it's just bones at that point, two years after the war is over. A lot of them buried before that, or another year or two. But anyway, all remained over there in the cemetery. So when you see emails showing American cemeteries, the number of guys there in those cemeteries, that only represents 40% of what was there. The other 60% were sent home. Got it? So when you're looking at a cemetery over there like Normandy, 10,000 graves, you've got to add another 60% to that. So when I get these emails, I write back and say, you know, thank you, I know what you're doing here, but you've got to understand, you're only looking at 40% of what was killed. So anyway, uh, there's a, I've visited every permanent cemetery since the war. Only one of the two in Italy but I've been to all of them in France, two in Belgium, one in Holland, one in Luxembourg. I've seen all of them. I've been over there many times because I've been doing my films over there. I, I did two films in France, I did two Bel films in Belgium, I did one in Germany. The film I did in Germany is about the German kids during the war. I interviewed people who were kids during the war, who are now between 70, uh, 76 and 86, to talk about their war experience and to talk about their experience with American GI, how we gave them love, food, and attention. And it's a, a very emotional film. Uh, it's, we got subtitles where people are t talking German. A couple of those Germans live here now, and they speak in English. Anyway, uh, so that's uh, why I've seen all these cemeteries, because I go over there and do these films. Uh, I don't do the cinematography 
but I do everything else. And uh, it's, uh, I'll tell you what, it's, I work, I work day and night for 14 years on these films for no profit, zero profit. And, and uh, if I wanted to get profit, I couldn't anyway because I had a hard enough time just raising the funds, working my ass off, get money from people, $10, $20, $50, $100, $1,000, $10,000 to do these films. And so there was no money for me and I, didn't, I went into it to do one film. And I got so many emails from people telling me to continue do, doing what I'm doing because my mission is to educate young people in particular about the high price of freedom. I know people like me in graves registration or combat medics, we know the high price of freedom because we saw it. I had a look in the, in, in the eyes of soldiers my age who were even, even the German soldiers with a cross on them like this or, or a, or, or a uh, St. Christopher's medal for those you, of you who are Catholic and I'm Catholic and I had a look at that. I had a look at bodies and all shapes of form. Imagine looking at a tanker who was coming out of his tank on fire and now there's just a big ball of charcoal there. Can you imagine that for an 18 year old kid that's still wet behind the ears so I have to witness all that. And then people say, did you have PTSD? My sister said I had nightmares. I don't remember a nightmare. What I do remember is going to sleep at night, sometimes I think about it, especially in my older years. I think about all these young kids that didn't even have a girlfriend who gave their life for this country. And I'm sorry, look at the shit that's going on in this country right now. That's all I'm gonna say. That's all I'm gonna say. These, these guys and gals, because we buried women also, gave their lives for this country and what it was like for them when they were growing up, what it was like for me when I was a kid and a teenager, what it was like for me. I had a great life and I had a great, I got married and my late wife passed away when my kids were 10 and 11, the boy 10 and the girl 11. She got lymphoma. I lived with her for five years when they were four and five, and they told her she's going to live for six months. How do you think I felt? And so, and she felt. And so we went through that. And then when the kids were 10 and 11, and their mother dies, think about that. You know what I say? If you live long enough, you're going to have at least one cross to bear. Okay? And the, the kids had the first cross when their mother died. They're living in Colorado now. My daughter has an autistic daughter, 12 years old. She, she had an MBA. She had, I put both of my kids through private colleges. With my money, I didn't get a dime from anybody. Uh, I had, had, uh, had to pay for everything myself. Notre Dame for my son, and the University of San Diego for my daughter, and, and put them through college and uh, did, did all that. So I'm more proud of putting my kids through college, raising them, boy, girl, Imagine me, you know, I was not, not as old as I am now, but I wasn't a young guy. And I had a young girl, 11 years old. You ladies know what I'm talking about. And so, uh, anyway, uh, getting back to, to the war, uh, I met a lot of great people in Europe. We have great friends in, in uh, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. By the way, let me tell you about the cemetery in the Netherlands. 8,300 guys buried there. Every grave is adopted. You know what that means? People put flowers on those graves from time to time. They don't do anything maintenance-wise with the grave. The ABMC does that. They do a great job of it. Uh, but uh, there's one cemetery over there, Henri Chapelle, where I know a lot about it because we had 17,300 guys buried there during the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, that cemetery, the permanent, that, that was, 17,300 in the dirt, in the farm there. And then when the war was over, they built another permanent cemetery, cemetery about 200 yards away. And there's a, a 9,000 there now from the 17,300. The others went home. But uh, uh, it, uh, the native people are the ones who had to disinter those graves and put them in caskets after the war. And a lot of those caskets were sitting on the ground with tops over them because of the weather uh, until uh, they could uh, get the cemetery built and the, and the next kid uh, saying whether they wanted the remains sent home or not. So, so uh, 
I, I'm involved in, 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 I wasn't involved in any of the disinterring, but we did disinter grave in Germany because uh, we went through, by the way, in France, the stench at, at Normandy, in Normandy got in your clothing, your shoes. You slept in a foxhole that way. Or if not in a foxhole, right next to the foxhole. And then in the Battle of Bosnia, coldest winter in 30 years, it was freezing. And the prisoners digging the graves had to use jackhammers to get through the ice and dig a grave. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it, it, look, nobody wanted to be in graves registration. I mean, guys that would come, come around looking for their buddies, especially in Normandy, the paratroopers, you know, nobody wanted to be in grazers. I didn't want to be in graves registration for damn sure, but I had to do it for 11 months every day. One day off in Paris, it was like the end of the war. It was a big standstill in the war when we were in Paris. And then after that, zoom over to Belgium. Belgium is raining like hell. And then we finally get to uh, 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 St. Uh, St. Mary, uh, to that metal block. We finally get to the cemetery that we initiated in Belgium, seven miles from the German border. And uh, it was raining, 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 and it was snowing, snowing, snowing. And so that, that was freezing weather. And so none of it was easy for that whole 11 months. I don't know how, uh, how I made it, uh, but you know, fortitude and uh, you just press on. And, uh, and so anybody got questions? No, keep going here. Uh, I had 35 minutes. When did I start? <laughs> did I use up the 35 minutes, Scott? Okay, a few questions. Yes, sir. I, I, it's not a question, but it's a uh, comment. When I first read your uh, the title of your uh, presentation about uh, the high, uh, high high importance of uh, yeah the high cost of freedom, and then I saw Graves Station, and I knew it, being a combat medic. I knew exactly what you meant. And you guys did not get enough credit for what you did. I know. <laughs> no, they did. And, and also, um, I, was, I was a psychiatrist, a retired psychiatrist, and they did. We didn't even have PSTD back in World War II. It was shell shock or what is combat it? Combat fatigue. Combat fatigue yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And and also. Because of the fact that we went, through, like you say, we went through seeing so many, so much death and so much of this high cost of freedom. Where did you serve? Uh, in Vietnam. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. You guys had it tough. We didn't have any ladies and kids shooting at us. Exactly. You know, and we didn't have to go through jungle. We didn't go through jungle. That in the war, we'd say, thank God we didn't have to worry about anything up above. Up still above us, like you just said. I'm, a, I'm 96 years old. You know, I love to tell people that when I'm on the phone with them trying to get something. You know, you're talking to a 96 year old guy here. Be patient with me. Damn it. You know, you try to figure out something with your computer or whatever. Hey, I don't want to fall off of that damn thing. Uh, yeah. No, I can stand up. Yeah. Uh, what did you do with the two dog tags? And what's the oh, purpose okay, of the dog okay, tags? Okay. That was when they dyed it. You know what I mean by that? Die cast? Yeah. Uh, they didn't put it between the teeth or anything like that. No. Yeah. One dog tag stayed on the body and one uh, went on the marker, wood marker that we used. And later on, another graze registration came in, put wooden crosses. So you had a dog tag on a wood cross. And then later on, of course, the marble. And the, those of you who have seen the Mar, I mean, I'm telling you, these cemeteries are fantastic. I would, if I had died over there, I would like to have stayed there. But my mother, knowing my mother, my Italian mother, uh, she would have me brought back home to a cemetery that she shows at no cost. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. I'm almost reluctant to ask this because I think it may be... A little bit louder. I say I have a question. I'm a little reluctant to ask it because I'm not sure if it's naive. How is it that some of our veterans came home and some were buried there? Oh, I think I told you that. After the war, 1947, two years later, the next of kin had the prerogative of having the, the bodies, the remains, returned in a casket 
lined the caskets, by the way, but they, they didn't open them, of course, because they're just bones. Or left over there. Got it? They can have yeah. the remains set home in a casket. And initially, they were all buried here. The initially, they were all buried in the dirt, in mattress covers. And the mattress covers get, you know, deteriorated. And oh, we, in Germany, I mean, yeah, Germany, the last cemetery you had there, a couple hundred miles from Berlin, Eisenach, uh, when the war ended <coughs> on uh, May 8th, then we had Memorial Day services at the cemeteries. And at that one cemetery where we ended up, that had to be disinterred and all those bodies put in boxes and sent to Belgium and Holland. And uh, we had uh, uh, German prisoners doing that work. And, but we had, we identified the remains as pretty gross. I don't talk about this to kids in schools, but anyway, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty bad. And, and, uh, and a stench with this is in May, so you got stench going with it. And you know, it's, it's I don't know if any of you, you have a loved one. I, I'm not, I don't like to get into that because it, w it was very gross, and they had to be sent back to temporary cemeteries. When you go back, uh, and you've been back to Normandy and Belgium, what is the reception from the European? Okay, uh, you know, you hear about how the Europeans don't like us. Well, I didn't find one that doesn't like us. I mean, I mean, look, as I just said, we were back, I was in Normandy about five times. I, the first time I went back was 50 years later. 40 years later, I could have gone when Reagan was the president. I was not interested in going back. And then 50, uh, what was it? When the hell was it? When Clinton was president, I went back. And then when Obama was president, I went back. And, uh, and so, and, and Trump. Uh, w Trump was there and uh, he did a very good job and he's in my film part of what he said as, it was, as is the uh, French president uh, but getting back to your question you know in Normandy they treat us like rock stars they have been doing this every every five years the, the first generation I still know a few people there from the first generation but the, they taught their kids well. The second generation, they're like in their 60s, and their kids, the third generation, I mean, these kids come out with their parents, and they, they're waving at us and throwing kisses at us and coming up to us and want, want to take a picture with us. If you take a picture with a couple, first thing you know, there's 50 people around, and they want your autograph. And I had cards made up for my guys that I took over there. And, and by the way, one of the guys I took over it was the first time he had, well, two of the guys, they were two Navy guys. They had never been there before, since the war. One was a, one was a uh, corpsman, and the other one was a signal man on a ship. <coughs> they were a little bit younger than I am because they were 17 when they, you know, so right now they're like 95, going on 96. But, but, uh, but I took a ranger, I took a ranger, Maybe you know his name. Uh, his name is uh, David Ren, R-A-A-E-N, Korea to Vietnam, uh, Major General. He was a he was a Ranger captain on D-Day, and I interviewed him. I had I had American Airlines send him and his physician because he's had heart failure. He's like right now he's 99, but uh, he was 97 when I took him over there. But anyway, uh, he. Uh, he, he travels with his physician, and I got both of them sent by American Airlines from Florida, first class. The rest of us went from Dallas, and they took my guys from Ohio, Pennsylvania, wherever they lived, from there, first class to Dallas, a big dinner and a big send-off, and, uh, and so uh, uh, they, they uh, then from Dallas to Paris. In Paris, I had a, 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 a bus, 50 passenger bus, it was a really nice bus. That I paid for all the funds I raised. You know, I thought I was gonna to have to dig into my own funds my, to do this film. And I was committed to these veterans and American Airlines and to myself. And my wife always told me, why don't you do a film about yourself? Why are you doing that with all these? I said, no, no, I have to have all these. I want veterans, Air Force, uh, uh, medics, combat engineers, 
one from each of the services, even the ranger. I had a hard time finding a ranger. They're dead, you know. And so anyway, he was a uh, he was a major general in Korea and Vietnam, and he lives in Florida now. He's written a book called Intact. If you want to get anyway. Okay, I'm sorry. Go, go too long in answering a question. Yeah, you. Why don't they put the date of birth on the? Why didn't they? Well, I, I, I was so upset when I was there with my... Repeat your question. I'll answer that for you. Repeat the question. They can't hear. Yeah, let me... Can I answer this question? Uh, Why they didn't put the data Okay, I'm, I'm going to answer that. Okay, what, ha what happened when I went over there and I saw there was no date of birth, uh, I was with my fiancé because I, I got married again uh, uh, 10 years after my... What, my wife died in 81. I met another lady in 91 and we got married in in 94. Anyway, she went with, the, she and my kids talked me into going. I had a freebie trip. And uh, so when I walked through the cemetery alone for a while, looking at the graves and thinking about maybe I helped bury that one, that one, I walked back to the woman and I said, look, you know there's no date of birth on these crosses, the stars of David, only the date of death. And I was so upset, I called the ABMC when I got home. Why didn't you put the date of birth? They blamed it on World War I, Pershing, that's the way they wanted it then. They didn't want any date of birth. And I think it's the worst thing they could have done because when you walk through these cemeteries and you have no idea how old these guys were, and you know there are people over there, young people, that have websites, that have researched who that soldier was. In Holland, they got pictures of these guys at the crosses. Holland is fantastic. They get about 300 visitors a day of Dutch people. And you know, most of them speak English over there. But anyway, they, that's what they, they pass the bus. First one is, um, did they do anything before you went to start identifying the bodies to prepare you for that at all? Did they, did they, oh, yeah. or they just said, here, go ahead and start looking at that? Yeah, we went through a regular uh, infantry basic training in Cheyenne. And then they sent us to Denver to a hospital to watch an autopsy. And I'm at the back of the room, you know, and watching these coroners saw the skull open. And so it was right, after, right before lunchtime. And that's the only thing they had us look at a dead body uh, autopsy. That's it. That's it. And then, and then two, two more. One is, where was your first, your first detail? You might have said I missed it. Where was the first Normandy. Time? Normandy was the first time. Oh, yeah, D-Day. D-Day. Oh, okay, you got it. And then the next one is, out of the people you identify, how many did, would you say you were not able to identify? Well... Like one every hundred or one every fifty or one every... Well, it's hard to say. It depended uh, on, on which, uh, which uh, uh, temporaries... Uh, or, or not even the temporaries. I mean, we, we, we had not much of an idea of that. But, but then, after the war, <coughs> uh, when they built the permanent cemeteries, then they had the records, and maybe 400 and some at this cemetery, you know, 300 and some at that cemetery. So it varied cemetery by cemetery where, where they were. As and did Germans have identifications on them or no? Did they have dog tags, German, the German soldiers? No, no they, they, didn't have, they did have identification, but, but not like our dog tags. And, there, and there's 14 year old kids buried there. See, they didn't take their dead back. And, and if you go to France, you can see a German cemetery there in Normandy. And they got grotesque monuments like four in a square, and they're dark brown. And you can read the date of birth. 14 year old kids in some of those graves. 14 year olds, you know, and, and, you know, with us there were some six, 16, there were guys, we all know I think that there were a lot of guys that volunteered that were 16, some of those guys were killed. Uh, time for one more question. Okay, you tell me who, that guy's back, way in the back there, I'll get you. I can't hear you. It did not change with the war in Vietnam. I had to go down to grave registration in Long Bay a couple of times to retrieve personal effects, and I never found anybody in graves registration that wanted to work there. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't want to work there. And you can imagine when I had a big fear of death as a little kid. And I had to go through that. Anyway, can you give us one other guy, guy here? What is it? Hey, George, you mentioned that the Germans did nothing to recover their own dead no, bodies. No, no, we did. 
You uh, did. Was there any effort on our part to get the information from the Germans you know, to the Germans? Hey, look, I, you know what? I was a private. I didn't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. anyway. Thank you all for listening. And, and, and one more commercial. Back there in my bag, I think I got nine DVDs from this. See it right there? That's me standing on the, on the beach at Normandy. You can see my, that's, that's two years ago. 2019 and that's about an hour and a half film and I'll tell you what if you buy it and you don't like it send it back I'll give you your money back everybody I hate to brag but I've got a lot of awards for that's you know I got a lot of gratification for doing this as hard as it was I mean I got to, oh man you deserve it I got I got to meet so many people uh, and you know, it's heartwarming to talk to a lot of these people who had members of their family uh, killed or still living. And uh, anyway, uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. See, that wasn't so bad. Can you all hear me, huh? Like I said, you're spilling your water. Like I said, I get, I get oh, I, I didn't pee there. That's <laughs> okay. So I got